What are all these strange white spots on this rock? I met up with Keweenaw guide Charlie Eschbach to find out more about the unique features of the Lake Superior shoreline in the Keweenaw. So these flows are some of the oldest rock in the world. You know, I mean, you think all, all rocks are old, but but these these are the, this is the very beginning. That's all right here tonight. So sit back, put your feet up. It's Monday night, and time for discovery. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone, forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. The call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure. The only way I measure Feelings that I have for this fine land There is so much to discover When you're a long-time lover Of northern Michigan There was a fault that starts out way south of here, but it surfaces in, in this area called the Keweenaw Fault. When that split open, if you can imagine the lava flows coming out, and then a hundred years, thousand years would go by, and another, another uh, layer would come out, and there were 40 some of these of these eruptions over over years and years and millennia. Each one would form another layer, another layer, so that's the way the Keweenaw was built. The Upper Peninsula is truly a land of wondrous features on a grand scale. From the colorful cliffs of pictured rocks to the picturesque porkies. A land of beautiful rivers and giant lakes. Far to the north is a remote 150 mile long by 50 mile wide stretch of land that projects out into Lake Superior known as the Keweenaw. What is it that makes the Keweenaw geologically unique? What cataclysmic events created this peninsula of natural wonders? To find out, I spent some time with veteran naturalist and Keweenaw tour guide, Charlie Eschbach. All of that lava came from down below, right? Deep in the center of the earth. Now that area is all empty, okay? So with all of this weight from the lava flows on top, it collapsed and the whole thing collapsed. Okay, so imagine my right elbow as the, the Isle Royale, and my left elbow as the Keweenaw. When this all collapsed, it formed a giant bowl, which is Lake Superior Basin. Now, it's a lot more complicated than that, but that's generally what happened, especially between the Keweenaw and Isle Royale. So that's why everything here is at an angle, whether it was a conglomerate bed or whether it was a lava flow. Everything tipped into the lake, Brockway Mountain. Okay, the north side of Brockway Mountain is a gentle slope running into the lake. Okay, the south side of Brockway Mountain is a cliff. Okay, that's the, those conglomerate beds tipped up. Okay, so, so, and s everything moves towards the lake. You go to Isle Royal, everything's coming up out of the lake on this side. On the south side is the gentle side. On the north side there is the cliffs. So we could go to, if we could go to Isle Royale today, we could look at the same beds of rocks that we see here that are outcropping there in the opposite direction, coming out of the lake and as they do in the Keweenaw. So that's roughly the way the Keweenaw was formed geologically. Because these beds, when it settled, they all tipped up. What happens when they tip up? The bottom layers are exposed. We can look at them today. And that's when it really gets interesting. Can you tell which direction Isle Royal is from here? It's to our right, 45 miles away. 
and in between there is a deep, deep, cold, freshwater sea we call Lake Superior. go back to the beginning of, the, of life on the earth. Okay, the first chapter of Genesis explains it in the Bible, explains it really well. When the, when the earth was dark and void and covered with water, okay, it says in Genesis. The first sign, then, then there was light, okay, then there was sunlight. And as sunlight came, then the very first plants that started to the process of photosynthesis were the algae. Okay, the old slimy green algae that we see on a pond where the water isn't moving is, was the first thing to start to photosynthesize, to produce energy, produce life from the sun. This is a petrified prehistoric bed of that algae. Okay. We know how old it is because the University of Michigan came in and drilled holes, took samples. They went all the way around Lake Superior and they sampled all of the different beds that they could find. These deposits are called stomatolites and the stomatolite beds around Lake Superior are very unique. A lot of them are different looking. Then they took all these samples and dated them. Since it's a living thing, they can carbon date them. And then by dating them, they were able to figure out which was the oldest, which were the, the most ancient. And from that, it helped them to figure out the story of how the Lake Superior Basin was formed. So can you imagine on this, the Earth's covered with water, but there's sunlight, and these beds of slime are floating around. Okay, now remember these conglomerate beds, which were formed much later, this has all been tipped up, right? See how they're slanting? It's all slanted into the lake. So if you took this, all these eons and eons and eons of sediment that made this deposit of Copper Harbor conglomerate, okay, sand and mud and gravel and rock, back in the beginning, here's the algae beds. Okay, can you imagine this bed of slime sliding in over this bed of mud? See, this was mud. It's now like a shale, but it was, originally it was mud. So this slime, this, this algae slime slid in here and was deposited on top of this. Then later, another bed of mud was washed in and covered it up. A lot of water came, and moved in all these pebbles. And then another bed of mud, look at, the, look at, you can tell it's water deposited. See the wave marks in it? Then you go up and here's, here's that sand bed in the creek and then it just keeps going up, going up another, what, 30 feet before we get to the top of this. So because when the Lake Superior bed was formed and all of this rock tilted into the lake, the bottom layers, which are the very oldest, was tipped up and exposed so we can see it. So it's a, it's a great place to study how from the very beginning, the oldest rock, all the way back to Genesis, and it's amazing now, as the scientists learn more and date this algae, how well it lines up with Genesis. And then what do we have from here to here? We got about six, seven, eight foot bed of gravel. Boy, there was a ferocious river deposited this in. Lots of moving water deposited all this cobble in here. Then we back up another six feet and we go into a, to another layer of where the, where the river calmed down and laid in sand and silt. And then we go another layer of the prehistoric algae, the stomatolite deposit. Pieces of lava rock that were now busted up and been rounded off by the lake and the glaciers and everything. But here, when this lava was cooling, there were gas bubbles in it that were trying to make their way to the top and these gas bubbles got trapped. So when we look at this, we can tell which direction was this, which end was up on this lava flow. When a bubble is traveling through liquid, 
It's bigger at the top, smaller at the bottom, isn't it? Teardrop shaped. So look at look at these. When I turned it there, you think that's up in this rock? I think so, because see how it's bigger? Bigger at the top, smaller at the bottom, a little bit of a teardrop. Okay, so this was the top of the lava flow. This rock, the stone was in, and when it cooled, these gas bubbles were empty, trapped. Then later on, maybe a hundred years later, maybe a thousand years later, there was another la lava eruption when the lava was pouring out and everything was hot and liquid, and a secondary mineral then was, was put into this rock mass, and it went and precipitated out to the little vesicles, to the voids, and that, in this case, is calcite. That's the white stuff. Okay, so we got calcite emigules. The empty gas pockets are called vesicles. The ones that are filled with a secondary mineral are called emigules. Okay, so the Quincy Mine in Hancock made millions of dollars on amygdaloidal copper. The secondary mineral that came up in the lava flows was molten copper. It filled in all those little gas pockets and when, so it made it easy to mine because they could crush the rock and the little BBs just fell out. So it was, it was a very uh, rich ore deposit because there was a lot of copper and a, and a lot of uh, these, these gas vessels. How did a couple of white pieces of marble, granite, get here? and all of these red looking conglomerate beds. Heron Mountains. This is a piece of the Heron Mountains. Heron Mountains are about, what, 45 miles from east of here? The glacial drug this chunk in here and just dropped it here. Can you imagine a mile thick ice over our head here? So when it started moving, when there were these huge channels in the ice that, that moved tremendous amounts of water and gravel and sand and boulders, it was, it was amazing, huh? Can you imagine how, what kind of water power it took to move a granite boulder like this, 45 miles? Now that's a natural bonsai. Hmm. Japanese take little trees and torture them for three or four hundred years and make them, make them into art forms, but the Kiwana does its own job. I've been watching that one now for 50 years and it hasn't changed. It grows a little bit, then the ice will knock it down. A limb will die and break off, but it's still the same. I've taken a couple that the ice would shear right off and destroy and cut a cookie out of them. Cut a cross section, put it under the microscope and count the growth rings. That's the only way you can count them. And, and it'll, they'll be two, three hundred years old. So I, would ex I expect that one to be in that range, two, three hundred years. Okay, so this little plant in this environment, it cannot get all of the nutrients that it needs. Because it's growing on just about bare rock, isn't it? So what it does to capture those minerals that are absent in the soil, each one of its leaves have little spikes, little fuzzy hairs, and each one of those hairs secretes a little drop of nectar, and that attracts an insect. Look at all the bugs in there. Okay, they're attracted by the nectar and they get stuck on there. Then gradually the plant absorbs the minerals in that bug's body and those are the minerals that are essential that's missing in the rest of the environment. What you can see is very delicate. It's not, it's not something that you would think would be growing on a, on a harsh coast of, of Lake Superior where the water is cold and the ice is deep in the winter and the, but but it it's protected by the deep snow and the ice okay because there's heat coming out of the ground all winter so if you if you were able to dig down a foot you know the temperature would be 36 38 degrees 
if you if you uh, measured the the temperature of the snow, it would be pretty close to 32. So between the two, this surface where these little plants are growing never freezes. So that's the way they survive. That's why we have such a unique plant community in the QNL because it's all protected by this big blanket of snow. It's hard to think of that as, as warmth, but in the natural world, 32 degrees is warm. It's time for a UP must-see destination break. We'll travel to the Grand Marais area and take a look at the Log Slide and Osable Dunes. The Log Slide is an area uh, just uh, west of Grand Marais. It's an area where in the late 1800s, probably peaked around 1880 with the logging of the uh, white pine in the area, the loggers would construct a, a long wooden chute down to the lake shore and send their logs down that to Lake Superior. From there, the logs were corralled up and floated around into the harbor in Grand Marais where there were a number of uh, sawmills and uh, businesses to, to haul the lumber uh, down to the Sini area before the railroad spur uh, got in the area. Um, today, uh, there's no structure there or even any photos. The problem was the logs shooting down there, the friction would build up and uh, burn the structure down. And so, to our knowledge, there's no actual photos of the log slide that was there. Today, a lot of folks like to walk down that to access the Lake Superior. And uh, we always warn them, coming back up, it's uh, a little bit tougher. It's, uh, uh, it's located kind of at the uh, west end of what we call the Grand Sable Dunes, which stretch from there back to Grand Marais. They're 200 to 250 feet high perched sand dunes. And as the wind action uh, brings the uh, sand down off the top or up from uh, Lake Superior, and it uh, continues to build them and keep them at that uh, sustained height. It's uh, probably one of the only areas uh, on Lake Superior that have dunes like that. Fantastic spot to watch uh, sunsets from the dunes. Pretty neat area. Beach peas. Beach? These are a little bit old, but if we, if we picked them uh, three weeks ago, they would have been real tasty to throw into a stir fry. This gray paint, that's a species of lichen. The charcoal, that's another species. That light orange, that's another species. Then you get into these grays. The reason they, they're different as we go up this rock is because Lake Superior pounds this rock. Only the, the fine ones that can grasp the rock, like these ones that look like paint, they hang on down here. You get up here, look at all the fuzzy ones up here. There's that wax paper lichen. Okay, here's the pretty orange ones. And why are they here? Because they've get, they're getting everything they need here. They're getting enough sun. They get all the morning sun, and they're getting the, the cool, damp, moist air off of Lake Superior. And they're getting a beautiful flow of air. And that's all they need, moisture, air, and sun. So this is a boreal forest. There's a thin strip of boreal forest all around the Keweenaw. And the only reason it's here is because of the influence of Lake Superior. And Lake Superior's cool, damp climate and uh, fosters this plant community, which is made up of eastern white pine, white spruce, uh, aspen, red maple, and, and it's, a, it's a dynamic forest that's always changing because the aspen and the spruce and so forth are not long-lived trees. They fall and cause an opening and another one comes up. And, and so it's, it's, a, uh, it's not, a, not a beautiful forest, but it's, it's unique to this area because normally we see the boreal forest up in Ontario and further north of here. But this is the this is a, a, an example we have right here. And probably it's only a quarter mile, some places maybe a half a mile deep from the shoreline around the Keweenaw. And you see it in other areas over, there's some good examples over in the Munising area, around Marquette, some good boreal forest areas too. Boreal is, is kind of the transition between the temperate forest and the, and the, and the Arctic. Okay, it's kind of the last forest community before the environment gets too harsh. 
gets subarctic. And when it comes to subarctic, then you only get one or two species like the sp spruce up in Churchill, Manitoba. All the little spruce trees are all six feet high. That's as big as they get, okay, because of the harshness. A lot of the white birch are, are big and dying because they, they've served their purpose. They've, they've stood here for, for 40, 50 years and dropped their leaves and built the, the soil up for, for the next type, along with the aspen and so on. So the next tree species that will get more prevalent in here will be the maples, will be mostly red maple in here. We have 50, 60 species of lichens in the Keweenaw. And the reason we have so many lichens is because of the quality of the air and the, the damp, cool air that's coming off of Lake Superior. See the lichen that's hanging down in the trees here? Looks like a moss. That's a usnea lichen. It's uh, very sensitive to the air quality. Remember, lichens are, are not a plant. They're a symbiotic relationship of a fungus and an algae. The fungus needs the algae because the algae can, can, can produce through photosynthesis. Okay, so they live together. They're, they're two entities working together. Since they get all their nutrition from the air, they're only using this tree for support. And they love it because you can see, see how it hangs down. Can you imagine getting all, the, all of its nourishment and what it needs from the sun and from the air? Of course, it gets its moisture from the air too. So lichens are very unique. And you look on that limb, not just the stuff that's hanging down, it looks mossy, there's four or five other species growing there. Look at how the lichens are so profuse. A lot more lichens than there was back up on the ridge. It just loves it. You can tell this is the perfect habitat. Just the amount, right amount of sun, moisture, and a beautiful flow of air coming off of Lake Superior. We're about 100 yards from the lake, and it's getting everything it needs. Well, I hope that gives you a better understanding of some of the features of our Keweenaw Peninsula and maybe your own backyard as well. I hope you enjoyed the show as much as I enjoyed making it. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week again right here on Discovering.